This morning, we continue our series on Methodism with a look at John Wesley's understanding of the role of grace, faith, and works in what he called the Ordo Salutis, or the Order of Salvation. As I mentioned last week, John Wesley, a priest in the Church of England and the father of the Methodist movement in England and eventually in America, developed a unique theological tradition that grew largely out of a tension between his own highly disciplined spiritual life and his encounter with Peter Bowler and a group of Moravian Christians whose emphasis on the primacy of grace in matters of salvation both attracted Wesley and troubled him. Following his encounter with the Moravians and his heartwarming experience at their meeting on Aldersgate Street in London, Wesley drew heavily on the resources available within his own Anglican tradition, plus what he'd learned from the Moravians, to work out a theology of salvation which maintained what he saw as the proper relationship between grace, faith, and works in this process of salvation. In his developing theology, Wesley sought not only to preserve the richness of his own theological tradition, but also to incorporate into it the emphasis on the primacy of grace he learned from the Moravians, while at the same time guarding against what he saw as the inherent weakness of the Moravian position, namely the emphasis on the totality of grace to the exclusion of good works. So what I'd like to focus on this morning is Wesley's understanding of the role of grace, faith, and works in the journey we call salvation. And I want to begin with one of my favorite Wesleyan concepts, his distinctive emphasis on what he called provenient grace. Provenient grace. According to Wesleyan theology, our salvation journey begins even before we are aware that God is seeking us. Provenient grace then simply refers to God's grace that, become, that comes before all else. The word provenient is used much as the word prevent was used in Wesley's day. Prevent meaning to come or go before, such as preventive medicine or preventive maintenance. As Wesley understood it, God's grace is at work in our lives even before we are aware of it, and it is something no person is ever totally lacking. That's why we baptize infants. It is this grace, this provenient grace, God's grace, that makes possible our response of faith. It's not something we can attain on our own. God is always the primary actor in our salvation. If God did not first work in us, it would be impossible for us to work or to even respond to God. For Wesley, it is always God who acts first. That's why I had us read a portion of Psalm 139 a little earlier. Oh God, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You see, the doctrine of provenient grace asserts that God is always with us, wooing us, seeking out a relationship with us, waiting for that moment when we will see, when we will respond, when we will finally understand that we need God in our lives, that without God we are lost, adrift, floating on a sea of meaninglessness. If we are truly honest, we all know that we are not the people God created us to be. And there are points in our lives when our discontentment opens the door to the recognition that there is more to life than just us. That there is something more, something bigger, something which gives our lives true meaning. And that something is God. When this happens, it is God's provenient grace that not only sparks this recognition, but also enables us to respond. 
to take that first step back towards God who created us and who has loved us all along. And then there's the concept of justifying grace. Our response to God's grace in our lives, to what God has already done for us, is what we call justifying grace. In a sense, it's our saying yes. Yes to God's grace at work in us. Yes to God's offer of a relationship. Yes to God's forgiveness and acceptance and the assurance that God loves us, even us. An important aside, this saying yes is always a choice, our choice. And we can and many do choose to say no. For some people, the saying yes to God is a rather momentous event, a time they can look back on and pinpoint as that moment when they accepted Christ and thus were dramatically changed as a result of what happened. And they speak of this reorientation to God, if you will, as their conversion. But not everybody has that kind of earth-shattering, mountaintop experience. That's why we as United Methodists speak of conversion as more of a process. Andy and Sally Langford put it this way, our conversion may be sudden and dramatic or gradual and cumulative. Some people journey towards God from the moment of their baptism as an infant or a child, while other people become Christians through a significant experience as youth or maybe as adults. This change in a person's life marks a new beginning, yet it also takes a whole lifetime to completely unfold. I'd like to add that it's not necessarily an either or. I think for many of us, it's a both and. Personally, I cannot remember a time when I did not believe in God. Thus, God has always been a significant part of my life's journey. But there have also been those pivotal life-changing moments when I've gone off course and something dramatic happened to bring me back to the God from whom I strayed. Wesley would call those moments little conversions, and I'm convinced that that's what he experienced that night at Aldersgate when he felt his heart strangely warmed. I also think that's true for most of us, and that's why I love the Wesley notion that salvation is not necessarily a one-and-done event, but a lifelong process of falling in love with God. Which brings us to the next step in the way of salvation, something called sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace refers to a continuing process of, of spiritual growth, a maturing into the life God intends for us, where by the power of God's grace at work in us, our lives are marked by an increasing capacity to love both God and neighbor. This is where Christian discipleship comes in. When Wesley had his heartwarming experience at Aldersgate, it never occurred to him to stop there, that he had somehow arrived, that he had achieved salvation and could thus sit back and enjoy. Quite the opposite was true. From that moment on, Wesley sought continuously to be more holy in his personal faith and more involved in changing the world in which he lived for the better and making it more like the kingdom of God, Jesus taught. Again, quoting the Langford, similarly, the United Methodists do not stop their journey of salvation with one experience. Through prayer, worship, Bible study, we continue to grow closer and closer to God. Through our mission outreach to people in need in our communities and around the world, we continue to grow more loving. Throughout our lives, we are nurtured in the church and empowered by God to become the loving people God created us to be. The classic language of sanctification reminds us that the Holy Spirit works within us until we become perfect in love. And this is what Wesley called the doctrine of Christian perfection. For him, it was the ultimate goal of the Christian life, perfect love of God and neighbor. It's a result of a gradual and continuing growing in grace, both realized and being realized. Love that matures into greater love. Loving God with all our heart and our neighbors as ourselves. And he said, not everyone will experience this Christian perfection. Think of someone like Mother Teresa 
But Wesley believed that it was nonetheless attainable and that it should be the ultimate goal of Christian life. When we're ordained, one of the questions they ask is, will you be going on to perfection? And the answer is yes. We may not ever get there, but we are going on to perfection. Perfection in love of God and neighbor. Not being perfect in how we act, but perfect love of God and neighbor. In Matthew 5, 48, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells his fathers, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus wouldn't have told us this if it wasn't something we, with God's grace working in us, could attain. But again, not perfect as we understand perfect without fault, but rather perfect in the way we love God and the other neighbor. That's the goal of a Christian life. To summarize, salvation for Wesley was truly a lifelong process, not just a one-time event. It's a process initiated by God's unmerited grace, but one that requires our response and our cooperation. A journey, not a destination. St. Saint Augustine said, God who created us without ourselves will not save us without ourselves. God's grace is freely available to all, but it is up to us to respond to that grace. The response Wesley talks about is that of faith, faith manifested in works of piety and mercy. His was a synergistic understanding of the relationship of grace, faith, and works. God's grace makes possible our faith, and that faith is lived out in our works in this process or journey we call salvation. Wesley was able to hold in tension that which was so often polarized, grace and works. And as United Methodists, we still hold in a healthy tension the values of both faith and works. We emphasize the importance of faith, our personal relationship with Christ, while at the same time preach that our love for God is made real through good works, thus our emphasis on missions. For it is in both faith and good works that we discover God's grace at work in us and grow more and more into the image of God in which we were all created. Thanks be to God. Amen.